Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Adult Improver edition of Perpetual Chess. We have been overdue to talk some hardcore chess improvement, and we've got a great guest to bring in uh, who we, we, we will introduce momentarily. Uh, first, I did want to give a shout out to the Patreon supporters of Perpetual Chess. I really can't express my gratitude enough uh, to the supporters of the pod who keep help keep the lights on here at Perpetual Chess. We recently, we're, get, we're back to doing special events. We recently had a lecture from Grandmaster Alex Lenderman. You can send questions to listeners. We're getting a bit more action in the Perpetual Chess Discord. So uh, anyone who is inclined and able to support, it's much appreciated. I'd like to give a shout out to recent uh, joiners, DFAM, RPM, Alexander Davis, Manchu Verma, Matt S., Alan May, Vahari Vamori, N.M. Paul Powell, Justin Tanis, Jason McAndrews, and Ariel Shulman. I also wanted to let listeners know about an exciting new tournament that's coming uh, called It's a Chess Punks Tournament. So those of you who are more online may have already caught this uh Gary Vandervelt of Chessable and Neil Bruce did a video uh, rolling out um, the tournament, and there's an article that I'll link to. But the long and short of it is it's kind of like Pog Champs for dedicated amateurs, um, and there's a qualifier. So uh, it's basically open to people interested. The qualifier is September 16th and 17th. Uh, details are still being finalized as I record this. There, there's a lot to go through. So I'll just link to all the information from chess.com, but I did want to let you guys know about it. Uh, one other thing before we bring our guest in, um, I am on my laptop for those of you watching on YouTube. So if the, if the setup looks unusually diagonal, um, that is why, but uh, we should be back to our regular setup next week. Now, our guest is um, someone who was on the pod recently when we did a national open tournament report um, to great acclaim. He is a USCF master. He's a strong and dedicated blitz player. He recently hit 2,500 on chess.com for the first time. He's also a software engineer for chess.com, a chess dad, an avid weightlifter. You can follow him on Twitter as strong chess. Um, and in addition to what we talked about last time, in addition to his own chess improvement, hard-earned opinions and hot takes, he's actually done a lot of research on the field of adult improvement on sort of what's possible, especially within the U.S. So we'll be getting into that as well. So without further ado, let's welcome NM Todd Bryant back to the pod. Welcome, Todd. Hello. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. And I have to say, I didn't know that you had a perpetual chess discord. I'm going to have to jump in that after this uh, after this show. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm really not great at like uh, remembering to mention everything. And there's always so many things to mention. But yeah, we definitely that would be you would be a great addition. Um, and Todd, before we get started talking, I want to dive right in, especially to all this research that you've done uh, involving rating gain from adults. But before we do that, I did want to give a shout out to Chessable, of course, who have you written code four years ago, now working more on the chess.com side. But yes. you actually helped me with a chapter. One of the sections of my book is about different tools for chess improvement. So one chapter is about chess base. You know, one chapter is about chess YouTubers. Of course, there's a chapter about chess books and there's a chapter about Chessable. And because you're so knowledgeable about Chessable, um, I actually had you help me out with that chapter, which you graciously did. Um, so that's a long way of asking you, Todd, what are your favorite Chessable courses? Yeah, so I've been using Chessable for a long time. I actually joined uh, Chessable at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I applied there directly because uh, it had been finally solving this problem that I'd had like my entire chess life of just chronically forgetting my openings studying something and then seeing it at the board and then never remembering it. Chessable will help me get a lot better with that. Uh, my favorite courses on Chessable, um, I'm a big fan of Gawain Jones. Uh, so his uh, King's Indian courses, um, I think are really fantastic. Um, they're very large, uh, kind of um, uh, more like quality chess opening book level uh, uh, courses, but they're very, very good. Um, I have a couple of little courses, lesser known ones that I like a lot. One of my favorite authors is a previous guest on your podcast, uh, Kamal Plipta. And what I like about his courses is that they tend to be uh, offbeat and creative and they are practical. So he has a course that's called like Secret Blitz Weapons, the Damiano Petrov. And it is based around a line for Black and the Petrov that is like considered to be kind of like a beginner trap. Uh, so this is where you go E4, E5, Knight of three, knight of six, and then knight takes e5, knight takes e4. Um, so this leads to like 
um, a common like beginner strap that kids learn about. But if Black starts playing good moves from this point, it's actually quite uh, tricky. You know, White never faces it, and there's many like fun traps in the opening. Uh, so that is one that I added to my Blitz repertoire um, with uh, with good results. And Plikta has a bunch of other um, courses that have a similar kind of approach. Like he likes creative lines and things that score well in the Lee Chess database. Yeah, shout out to Camille Plikta, Blitz Beast as well. Yeah, and I'm a fan yes. of his uh, Anti-Anti-Sicilians course. And I know Yeah, I have that one too. That's a good one. That's yeah. actually, that book is one of the only like kind of full-fledged uh, courses or books against... Uh, the uh, anti-Sicilians. There's also a book by Catronius um, that covers them. Although I'm particularly partial to uh, Plutus' book on the anti-anti-Sicilians. Yeah, and and I say this, I say this frequently. But if you're an amateur level player, the anti-Sicilians are basically the main lines. Like yes, you know, absolutely. You can pretend all you want that you're going to get all these night dwarfs and these dragons, but it's going to be like fifty percent anti-Sicilians. Which yeah, maybe you can, more. You know, yeah. at some point, yeah. Yeah. And when you consider sub variations, whereas like, OK, if you get the night orf, like then you've got six moves, even more than six moves to study right off the bat. Whereas the anti Sicilian, there might be fewer branches. So the ROI on studying them is actually higher. Um, yes. But anyway, I will come back to openings because I know you got a spicy repertoire and you work hard on them. But the, the thing I'm most eager to talk about, because you've teased this on Twitter a few times in the past months, you have been doing an independent research project. Um, basically trying to determine who some of the greatest uh, improvers in, in history are, and I, I at least in U.S. history, because I know that's where you can get the data. And yes. I'll, I'll let you explain in a minute, but I did just want to say, like, obviously, we all have to make our own choices about how we um, spend our time. And a lot of people might be spending huge amounts of time trying to improve at chess. And I'm not necessarily saying that's what people should be doing, but I do think your data is quite helpful in establishing a boundary of what's possible. Um, so with that caveat out of the way, Todd, uh, what was the genesis of this project? Yeah, so um, I've always been a data person. Uh, the past uh, almost 10 years, I've been um, a software developer, but I've had a specific fo focus always on like data and databases and these kinds of things. Um, so I have been reading for a long time uh, the kind of hot interest that people have in adult improvements and the questions that they have around like what is possible um, and what kind of rating gains they can or should be making um, and all these kinds of things. And this is an area where I think there is a lot of uh, uh, you know speculation uh, that gets bandied around, but people don't necessarily know uh, what the data actually say. And I think that, uh, so the whole way that I look at this is I think there's two ways that uh, you can actually like know something and be, uh, be, be, be confident in it. There's real science and there's bro science. And both of these <laughs> are important. So real science is when something is like actually measured or observed, you know, it's been like studied and sort of concretely proven to be true with rigorous methods. And bro science is kind of the opposite of that, but it's also very helpful for understanding things and navigating the world, which is just the comp compilation of like conventional wisdom and your own personal experience and anecdote and things that you tried or have witnessed, um, you know, just kind of the intuition that you develop from that. Uh, so both of these are important. Uh, so on this topic, there's kind of a lack of real science, even though the data is out there on various websites, it hasn't been like downloaded and put together in, in any form. Um, but there is uh, the bro science uh, side of this, which is that my general intuition says that, um, you know, odd cases of uh, adult improvement, including some spectacular ones are out there, but also that in general, um, it's quite difficult. Um, it gets harder the older you are, and it gets harder, you know, the higher you rise up the rating scale. Um, so I wanted to add some real science to this to find out um, what has been done in uh, the past. And in doing so, um, I found a general pattern that supported my conclusion that um, improvement as an adult, especially large improvement or into high heights, is not super common, but also that there are many of these fantastic uh, stories out there, um, many of which I had never heard of before until I started this project. Yeah, it's fascinating. And Todd did share with me um, a Google Drive spreadsheet, which is, um, you know, pretty 
um, not a ton of data, but the bare essentials, basically, uh, what year people were born, what year they were at a certain rating, um, what what year the rating peaked at. And I did appreciate, Todd, that you that you filtered for age, as you say, so that because um, anecdotally, bro science, um, I've I've definitely observed through all the interviews I've done with many extremely accomplished improvers that between 20 and 30 it doesn't seem terribly unusual to gain hundreds of points, um, mm-hmm. even up to the, the the master level. It's beyond that where it gets more rare. But I know, and but I know that you found data um, that uh, that shows that the cases are out there. Now, one thing that I think you highlighted on Twitter at some point, Todd, is um, why is it that this is only a U.S. based uh, research project? Yeah. So um, I'll describe the kind of data that I got. So. Uh, my data set um, is players who have FIDE IDs. I need this because FIDE publishes uh, birth year and uh, USCF does not. Uh, and I used American players with USCF histories uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, because at the amateur level, there is much more data uh, in USCF histories than there is at FIDE, right? So when somebody is like improving from a beginner or like going through like, you know, the middle uh Uh, club level of the rating scale, they're going to have lots of tournaments um, in the USCF and probably not that many in FIDE. So there's just much more data there. Um, Also, the other uh, element to this is that I'm an American player and I've been looking at USCF results my entire life. Uh, So with USCF data specifically, I was in a good position to make uh, the various judgment calls that were needed to uh, clean the data and figure out like where the glitches and bugs were and establish you know, what was a real uh, improvement at a certain age versus something weird happening with the provisional rating and so on. Right. Well said. Yeah. And and we should say, I mean, we're interested, obviously, in the topic of of what's possible for people from from all places. But but yes. as you say, uh, we, we've got more familiarity with the U.S. And it was only through, as you said, sort of cross-referencing since USCF doesn't have birth year and FIDE does, and yes. FIDE doesn't have a lot of data and USCF does, it was only through those two things that you were able to get that data. And before we get to some of the um, standout cases, Todd, like how did you gather the US players? Because I you know, I also know my way around the tournament history page and a rating graph. I, is there a way to grab the data in bulk? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple of lists that are published. So if you look at the all states, uh, like top player lists of uh, the USCF, uh, there is um, a large list of names and USCF IDs. Um, My main starting point was FIDE because FIDE every month publishes a giant list of all the FIDE IDs and all the ratings and all the federations. Um, So I started there. Um, Of those, I got about 8,000 uh, U.S. players that also had uh, FIDE IDs, and I was able to download their rating history um, using a Python script, uh, just downloading it uh, automatically from the uh, from the USCF websites. Uh, well done. Um, okay, and I'm sure that uh, anyone interested, who a fellow data nerd like you, can likely reach out to you for um, anyone yeah. who wants to uh, do do additional or independent research. But obviously, I'm extremely grateful that you did what you've done already. So let's get to it. I mean, so what are the outer bounds of what's possible? So let's start with uh, between the ages of 20 and 30. What were sort of the the outlier cases of improvement that you found? And I think in some cases, Todd will be sharing names, but not all. Yeah, so this was a really um, interesting one. So I looked at two cases of, uh, of large rating changes, um, starting with uh, uh, large rating changes that happened after the age of 25. Um, so uh just gonna sort this uh yeah uh so there were a handful of cases in here where people made as adults so beginning at some age uh after 25 and continuing on uh rating gains of over a thousand points uh and so this uh uh really surprised me i found a couple of fantastic cases here the number one uh person that i found i i, I referred to him as king of the adult improvers uh to you was a player that i had never heard of I, although i friended him on facebook after finding him in this research uh he's a player named michael johnson from kentucky and michael johnson started 
playing chess. Uh, apparently, as a beginner, he started with around a 1,000 uh, USCF rating. I think he had a provisional rating in the triple digits even. And this dude kept playing uh, all the time, uh, year after year. And at the age of 55, possibly 56, he reached his maximum rating of 2135. So this is a guy that started basically as a total beginner um, and reached uh, a very high rating at uh, a very late age. Um, and I looked him up on Facebook. The guy still plays uh, chess all the time. He's posting you know, very regularly on Facebook about like, some chess set that he bought or some tournament that's coming up. Um, he just seems to be like a really dedicated uh, lifelong club player starting at, you know, his late, late thirties. Excellent. Yeah. And before you guys ask, I, I may at some point, uh, you know, try to interview some of the people that Todd mentioned. Again, I do want to stress that um, I know a few of the stories I've seen Todd's list. So a few of the people have already been on the podcast. So a couple of them I, I've heard anecdotes about, um, but again, just want to stress, like, if someone is studying eight hours a day, I'm not advocating that as a lifestyle necessarily. Um, but I think there also are cases like Michael of someone where it's more about perseverance and yeah. doing a little bit over an extremely long period of time. Yes, um, absolutely. And that was just a common thread that I noticed in all of these people, like virtually every case is that when I looked at their rating graph, it was always immediately very jagged over the entire period, meaning that they were playing regularly uh, the entire time. And frequently, these people were playing something like every weekend or every month at their local club. That seems to be another um, common uh, theme to get the number of games in, probably without you know breaking the bank um, and having to do a lot of complicated travel. Um, and it also made me suspect that maybe like playing at your local club rather than going to, you know, like the World Open or like these big like international tournaments um, is possibly better game selection uh, for players in the club uh, club level. Could you, I think I know what you're getting at, but could you expound on that? Well, uh, you know, when you go to these like large money tournaments, you play like a lot of like super hungry, like a high quotient of super hungry, rapidly improving uh, uh, young kids. Um, and so I think that the chances that you run into somebody who is underrated uh, is higher at these uh, at these tournaments. Um, and uh, yeah, I just noticed this common theme that many of these players, they were playing lots and lots of regular, you know, weekends, you know, quads or, you know, game 40 type tournaments at their local club instead of constantly visiting these uh, big money, big ticket events. Yeah. And one case that comes to mind is uh, Philemon Thomas, who I interviewed a couple of years back. He came mm -hmm. up in your data, right, Todd? I think he narrowly escaped my data, possibly for two reasons. I think he may not have a FIDE ID. So there's a couple of uh, like really fantastic cases where the person didn't have a FIDE ID and therefore skipped my uh, uh, spreadsheet. Um, I think he's also like the start of his rating range was like slightly under my cutoff of 25. There was some reason for this. Uh, but another one that narrowly escaped my data was Fred Wilson. Um, who I'll bring up later because there's something that I call like a Fred Wilson uh, shape to uh, uh, these like improving players who reach rating highs uh, at late ages. Uh, but Fred Wilson doesn't have a FIDE ID, um, but he famously achieved the 2200 uh, uh, level at age uh, like 70 or 71. Yeah, shout out to Fred Wilson, who's been on the podcast and yeah. may even be listening. Um, and as we move up the age uh, spectrum, Todd, so what did you find as as you get out of your 20s? Uh, yeah, uh, so I was also interested in uh, the changes, large rating changes after age 50. Um, and here there were not a lot of cases of players um you know, making big jumps into like, you know, master level and beyond, but there were uh, plenty of them. I think I have about a hundred uh, cases of 200 plus point jumps made somewhere beginning somewhere after age 50. Uh, and some of the cases are uh, fantastic. Um, uh, my favorite one, uh, uh, which really blew me away and is also somewhat bittersweet due to the specific number involved, was a player, a player that I might have met because he was a regular at the first chess club that I uh, ever played at growing up in Maryland, the NIH chess club. It met at a cafeteria in the National Institute of Health. Uh, and this is a player, Tom Hoopengardner from Maryland, who um, 
also seemingly started playing chess at a relatively late age or had, you know, a lower club rating, you know, in like his late 30s or 40s, something like that. Um, but between the ages of 57.6 and uh, 71 or 72, uh, whichever it is here, uh, this guy uh, just played all the time. And he achieved a peak rating at uh, the breathtaking age of 71. The bittersweet part of this story is that that peak rating was 1999, uh-huh. um, after which, you know, uh, he continued to play and held a level at around the uh, 1900s before um, uh, his USCF history stopped in, I believe, 2021. So 1600 to um, 1999, all over the age of 50 is the outer bound of of what an ambitious 50 year old is not to say more can't be done more i'm sure can be done but that's that's the highest that's the biggest feat you found yeah and there are a couple of these cases of somebody doing something into the 70s fred wilson had a typical pattern of players who reach a peak rating peak rating at a late age which was that he had this strength that he had held for most of his life uh, and he held that, you know, throughout the decades, he didn't lose strength. And then eventually at some late age, he made like a last little push and got the, uh, the final, you know, 50 or, um, 100 points. That's the typical pattern with, um, players who are reaching peaks in their, you know, fifties, sixties, or even seventies. Uh, but Arut Yanov apparently made a big push from the 1900s above 2200, uh, at the age of 60, which, uh, was really fantastic. That's interesting. I mean, I personally know of a few USCF masters who retired fairly early, you know, like FM Doug Eckert, who's been on the pod and uh, a couple other people. So I'm curious to see and people like that may be spending like four hours a day and may not be as financially constrained as uh, some others. Um, So I am curious to see. I love tracking stories like that. But but yeah, yeah, obviously, those are unique circumstances. And of course, you mentioned uh, I know you were defending a uh, friend of the pod, James Altisher, who so far yes. his rating is only going down, but which I can relate to, of course. But um, but he's putting in huge hours and taking advantage of his unique uh, life circumstances. Yeah, James Altisher is a really interesting person. I've met him now at a couple uh, tournaments. I've always consumed his stuff. I've listened to his podcast. I read his blogs. I used to bring him up all the time when I talked about how you shouldn't buy a house, you should rent instead. He had all these like uh, interesting and offbeat uh, takes on things. Um, but yeah, I've talked to him at a couple tournaments. Um, I really liked that. Uh, he seems quite genuine. Uh, you know, he seems, uh, in person, like exactly like he seems in his blogs and his podcasts, which is, uh, really cool. And, uh, I have a couple of interesting thoughts about James Altucher specifically. So, uh, James is, uh, I think around 55 now, uh, and he came back to uh, tournament chess with a, uh, 2200 rating that he achieved in, uh, the nineties. And he's trying to uh, regain his level. And uh, yeah, he's currently bouncing around uh, the 2000 to 2100 band. He's somewhat of a high variance uh, player where he has uh, swings uh, both up and down. I think that the one thing that my data uh, do suggest is uh, that what he's doing is theoretically possible and there's precedence uh, for it because he is a player who is... uh, trying to fit into more of that Fred Wilson shape where basically his entire life, like dating back to his twenties, he's had um, a strength somewhere in the uh, low master or expert uh, range. Uh, So what he needs to do is make that last little, um, last little push to uh, 2200. And an interesting thing that came up with him is that I've listened to him discuss his just progress uh, on a bunch of podcasts. And he has a book, um, called Skip the Line, uh, which is about finding like unorthodox or like, you know, unusual uh, ways to uh, uh, to do difficult things. And people have asked him, is there a way to skip the line with chess? And he basically says, no, like, you know, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's pretty difficult. I don't think there are really any shortcuts, but there is uh, one pattern that I've seen with a lot of these players, um, which is that uh, a lot of these guys that have high jumps, um, played a lot and benefited at some point from variance. Right. So your rating is basically a random variable. And especially if you play a lot, especially if you play a lot of blitz online, it will bounce around um, a lot. So in order to hit a 22 rating, you don't necessarily have to be uh, a 2200 strength. What you have to be is a 2100 strength and then play a lot and then eventually benefit from uh 
some positive variants. So I think in that way, there is a way to uh, to skip the line. And it's a pattern that I see with a lot of these players who are just fighting it out every single weekend tournaments and eventually catch um, a big run of good results and hit their like maximum potential rating. Yeah. Yeah. That, that goes unspoken at times, but I definitely, I mean, it's, it, it just intuitively makes sense that, you know, we're yeah. ratings are on yeah. average. This came so. up with, um, with one of my friends who appeared on this list. So, um, in the, uh, giant big rating changes after 25 spreadsheet that I have, there's a lot of professional players who like were achieving their, you know, maximum, like 2,700 rating, you know, somewhere between ages 25 and 35. And then there were a handful of, uh, people that I think of as, as more mortals, um, who, uh, achieved large increases into, um, high levels and about the best that I saw on this spreadsheet was players who went from a 2200 level to uh, maybe 2400 uscf and it was the same thing with these players they were all super active and playing all the time and peter manier was one of them he's one of my ask uh, you about him go go yeah yeah. so he's one of my oldest friends in chess uh uh he was a player that i knew from online chess servers initially um and then i started seeing him when i was a teenager and he was probably like in his uh earlier mid-20s at uh, tournaments in the uh, Maryland and uh, Northeast area. And uh, yeah, Peter just uh, played all the time. He went from about, you know, 2100 somewhere in adulthood to a peak rating of 2429. And I knew him because I was living in New Jersey uh, when he hit that, you know, 2400 rating. And he referred to himself as being overrated when he hit the 2400 uh, level. And I thought that he was just being modest because, you know, P- Peter is like, uh, you know, he's like a pretty modest guy. Uh, but he was probably, you know, just uh, uh, saying something honest about, you know, what happens when you play like lots and lots of games and eventually catch uh, a run of luck. And I've seen that myself now, uh, where when I hit peak um, blitz ratings, like it's always after a rush of like good results of, you know, lots of players like falling into opening traps or like, uh, you know, collapsing in um, time scrambles or, you know, uh losing their net, internet and disconnecting, you know, a, a lot of things going my way to hit those peak ratings. Yeah. Yeah. And Peter, yeah. Also shared history here because he's from Pennsylvania Yeah, um, from my generation. So I, when I would made master at 18, I think he was around 1900 and then he played more actively than me in the subsequent years. And I remember at some point being like, wow, what is, you know, what is he doing? Because yeah, yeah. as you said, got to, got to 2,400. Uh, shout out to Peter. Now, final thing on ratings before we get to your own chess improvement, Todd, I know you've, you've weighed in on the whole rating deflation thing. And I know you said, uh, you recently had a tweet where you were saying like, you're going to have to achieve your new feed a peak on in like post COVID hard mode. Yes. So, how do you conceptualize uh, these rating changes in the wake of at least pending FIDE changes? And as of now, there's no USCF changes, like pending um, perhaps um, a deflated rating scale, at least uh, with FIDE, and in my opinion, with USCF as well. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question. Um, this is where the bro science uh, comes in a little bit, uh, because I definitely share this intuition that ratings now are different than they were even 10 years ago, and definitely that they were 20 years ago. Um, but I don't have any like hard proof of this deflation, at least in uh, the USCF rating system. This is something that maybe I could look into in the future, but it's a little tricky. So I'm not 100% confident that this uh, concept of USCF deflation is real, but I also have a suspicion uh, just based on my personal experience that um, that there's uh, there's something out there. One thing I did notice in the data is looking at players who reach 2200 at late ages, like you know, at above the age of like 35, maybe. Um, there are some of them out there, but uh, there are very few or almost none uh, in the post COVID era. Uh, there were a couple. Uh, one of my friends, um, Paul Yanuma or Paul Yanuma from uh, Hawaii. Uh, hit 2200 at the age of 36 in like 2021. Um, and, you know, there are a couple uh, uh, others here and there, uh, but there seem to be much less uh, players reaching these milestones at late ages in uh, recent years, which might be somewhat telling. Uh, but on the other hand, 
there's also been a large demographic shift in U.S. chess where players above the age of 40 seem to be participating much less than they used to be. The, the demographics are getting uh, much younger in U.S. chess. So it's not entirely clear what is going on in terms of rating deflation, but I suspect that uh, there has been something going on in the past five to 10 years. Yeah, that's that's my suspicion as well. But like you say, um, we don't know for sure. Um, and hearing you mention someone from Hawaii, of course, <laughs> shout out to I don't know this this gentleman you mentioned, but obviously it yeah. could have its own little rating bubble like. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that was one of his uh, his problems. I, I I think that he was like a pretty good blitz player online um, and he was playing a lot, but uh, he needed to, uh, you know, take expensive trips to play more major tournaments. And so that was one of the factors, I think, with him hitting 2200 at uh, at a later age. Yeah. And and to be clear, I, I've only been to Hawaii once and I didn't play chess there. Um, so but so the rating could scale could just as easily be higher as lower. But it's easy to envision a scenario where it develops its own little uh you know, its own little numerical system where if the people exactly. in, in on that island aren't traveling enough to sort of calibrate to the rest of uh, the U.S., um, it, it could be off in either direction. Absolutely. Um, well, Todd, it's fascinating stuff. Really appreciate that that you've uh, you've taken all this time to gather all this data. Um, is there anything that you took away from this, like in terms of like how you approach chess? Yeah, I mean, I think that's... Um... The main thing that I saw was the persistence and the constant playing of uh, all these players. And it made me wonder if, you know, I've been uh, skewing my tournaments more towards larger events in recent years. And it made me wonder if I should maybe be playing like every month at like the local club here in St. Petersburg uh, much more than I am, just in order to get the, the constant kind of reps of tournament chess in. I think I had maybe a little fear for a while that, uh, those tournaments were bad for my rating, that maybe I wasn't as good at the uh, the game 30 time controls as slower tournaments, or that maybe in local tournaments, I was more likely to get nicked by uh, a lower rated player. I'm not sure that either of those are necessarily true, especially now that I'm playing a lot of Blitz. Um, so that was one of the main um, things for me. I also, I had a good experience looking through all of this data. I think that on social media, there is a lot of like, anxiety that can be caused by the constant like speculation and comparison of yourself uh, to others. And it was somewhat reassuring uh, to look at this data and see that, you know, improvement as an adult or improvement above a certain level at adults as, as an adult is quite difficult. Like it's not just you, like th there is something about it that uh, seems to be quite difficult, but also uh, that it has been done uh, in certain cases by, uh, uh, some of these very interesting people. It, it, just just looking over this data, especially over the past couple of days as I was cleaning it all up to get ready for this podcast, uh, was very uh, uh, just kind of satisfying and soothing for me. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fascinating, and like you say, the stories are out there. So, do you have? Has it altered your goals? Do you have any secret? goals i mean as you say it does feel like anything we try to do in the current climate is on hard mode um but but are, do, do you have like how how um number driven are you uh, as opposed yeah. to process driven yeah no so i think this is very important um uh this is part of my philosophy and maybe um it's been strengthened by seeing these players who had these great improvements but were just constant like club level weekend warriors where I think that it's very important not to think about um, like what your rating should be or what it could be after X hours of study for, you know, Y years. Um, and instead your focus should just be relentlessly uh, on uh, playing chess, uh, playing a lot of chess, trying to play as well as you can and trying to learn things. There is a very um, common thing that happens in strength training. Uh, where people, especially at the beginning, are obsessed with knowing like, well, what should my bench press be after like one year? Or, you know, what should the ratio of my squat and deadlift be? You know, like what should my numbers um, be after like various periods of time? And the answer to this is always like, I can't tell you. I can tell you maybe some like generic ranges of what uh, is common at maybe your gender and your age brackets. Uh, but what happens to you uh, is just going to be 
um, highly individual and depend on a lot of factors that are just specific to you. And instead of worrying about this and comparing yourself to others, uh, you should just care about uh, what you're doing, about trying to lift well, trying to train consistently, trying to eat and sleep well. Just focus on those things because uh, you have a limited, you know, amount of attention and time in life and you need to allocate it towards the things that actually can drive your progress instead of you know worrying about where you should be or how you stack up to others well said and of course easier said than done but obviously <laughs> yes but obviously um comes from a pure place and so we talked in our national open tournament report you mentioned um you know you love openings you enjoy studying them you love speed chess you're good at it um, how much of your approach to uh, spend emphasizing those two things a lot is based on the fact that you enjoy them and how much of it is based on, air quotes, optimizing your chess? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think that a lot of it is based on the fact uh, that I like enjoy playing Blitz. I'm motivated by playing Blitz and I'm highly engaged. Uh, when I play Blitz, there are other activities that some people claim they get mileage out of, but this never like really clicked for me. Like looking at game collections, for example, like I get bored. I, you know, when I'm doing it, like I'm not fully focused necessarily. Like I'm not really like locked in. I think that in order for, um, you know, any kind of training to be useful, uh, it has to be somewhat difficult and it has to be, you know, somewhat stressful. You know, you have to feel like, you know, you're working and pushing yourself a little bit. And when I play Blitz, like I always uh, have that feeling like um, I always care a lot about uh, basically every Blitz game. Like a lot of people have said that, you know, they play Blitz like on their phone while they're watching Netflix and they're just kind of tossing out moves and not paying attention. I've never had that experience. I'm always very engaged when I'm doing it. Um, so for me, uh, Blitz is uh, the thing that I'm like motivated to do that I'm engaged uh, when I'm doing it and that I can get a little bit of feedback from every single game, every single game and make little improvements with. I've always had one of these things in chess over the years. Um, in the past years ago, it was working through Diveretti's uh, Endgame book. Uh, that was kind of like the main thing that I was doing with chess. Uh, years before that, it was grinding chess tempo puzzles. And that was how I got better at, you know, kind of like slower calculation. But I've always had that one thing in chess that like uh, motivates me and uh, is this kind of the single thing that I do over and over uh, while training. A lot of it is about, you know, consistency and staying engaged. Okay. And of course, you've got a family, Todd. So when you do play your blitz like or is your family ever in the room or are you like i'm in the office close the door like how how serious are we talking yeah no i've gotten better uh at that over the years yeah i think that in general if you want to have good results you do need to find you know some time in your day where you can be in a quiet room uh where you're not at risk of being distracted and uh, where you can focus uh, preferably in silence. Um, yeah, like you say, that's like easier said than done. So sometimes, you know, I'm playing after work and like my kids are running around and whatever. Uh, uh, but I generally try to, um, you know, have like a serious environment uh, when I'm when I'm playing Blitz. Okay. And yeah, I'm, I talked to you off about this briefly offline at some point, but I'll give you a quick update. So, you know, listeners probably tired of hearing about my book coming November 1st, be sure to pre-order available in audiobook and new in chess reader and Kindle. Um, and the list goes on, but anyway, so since the book, I was going to get back to serious chess, but, um, and that's been about two months. I did play a tournament and did decently, but, um, I'm still struggling with motivation to do anything other than I, I enjoy my like daily 20 minutes of chessable opening review. And I've been learning a new opening, which I, I find engaging. Yeah. Um, and then I enjoy playing blitz. And of course, I'm always doing chess reading on the side for the, the podcast. You know, we've got another book recap coming up and interviews and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm always and of course, following the World Cup. So I'm very active in, in the chess world. But the only thing I want to do with my own chess is, is play Blitz. Yeah, I think that's fine. I, I think that this is one of those things that I really changed my opinion on. Uh, over the years, it was one of a couple of Greg Shahadi blog posts that I didn't agree with initially. And then years later, um, I changed my tune. And one of them was a post that he wrote about how like Blitz is totally overhated and all of the best players, uh, you know, the best junior players are like 
playing hours of Blitz a day, just playing it all the time. And if they're all doing that, it can't be that bad. And I think that Blitz is something that really gives you um, a good exposure to a lot of chess uh, in a minimum of time. Uh, I think that one issue for me uh, when I was like, you know, in the 2100s, even in the low 2200s for a while was that I was very... Um, over allocated to like calculation and tactics and my and my chess skills. And I didn't know my openings that well. And I was uh, particularly kind of adrift when making like early middle game uh, decisions. Like there's a lot of times where I would like get in some unfamiliar opening and then just be tanking with no clue of what to do, or I would get out of the opening and then not know what to do with my pieces. Um, and so I had a close friend, uh, my friend Aaron Khan tell me uh, that I need to uh, at some point get um, you know, like a book on like the early middle game and like figure out how to like plan in the early middle game. I didn't do that. But what I ended up doing was playing like thousands and thousands of blitz games across my entire repertoire and looking at them with the computer a little bit each time. And from this, I finally developed an intuition for like what I'm supposed to be doing in the middle game. Like, I feel like I never am just like clueless and out at sea anymore in the early middle game, just because uh, of all this exposure that I've had to the middle games and the structures playing lots and lots of blitz. Well said. Yeah, I, I've experienced that too. And I do review my games. Like that's one thing is when I play the blitz game, I'm not going to spend hours pouring over it, but I yeah. have a, I do follow my rule where I always look at the game. And, you know, if you review it in Lee Chess, the Grandmaster games will pop up. So sometimes instead of trying to really focus on uh, memorization, uh, especially for some of the quieter openings I'll play, I'll just look, I'll just run through one game that a Grandmaster played, you know? Um, yeah immediately after my blitz game. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's gonna, you know, um, Magnus's crown is probably safe. Um, but, but it, it, it's a way for me to organically study chess. Um, whereas it can feel like work if in some other yeah. circumstances, especially unfortunately with, uh, calculation work. Yeah, that was an issue for me. I used to have this like perfectionist attitude toward reviewing my games where I either wouldn't do it or I would like make these complicated files with like full, I'm typing in like full sentences and like, you know, this like time consuming stuff. And I, I, I totally don't do that anymore. I think that playing a Blitz game is just about like getting one little drop of extra knowledge. So like every game, I always look up the opening against my Chessable or, uh, you know, my, my PGN files uh, to see who went wrong in the opening. And I always take a quick look with like game review or whatever to identify any like key moments where I made a wrong decision. It's just like a quick look. It's easy to do. I don't get hung up on it, but doing it, you know, 10,000 times, you start to accumulate knowledge. Well said. Yeah. And I, of course, wrote about speed chess in my book as well. Some of the conclusions are sort of echo what, what you've been saying. Um, but I do wonder at what point as you're sort of newer or lower rated, like, um, do you do you think there's a point a rating below which roughly, of course, one should not be playing Blitz, or do you think Blitz is for everyone? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, especially for like beginners, like I've seen a lot of like from students or like um, like my son when he was starting to play chess. There is a point where um, you know at least below like the one thousand level and Blitz, you're kind of just making random moves, and it's not uh, instructional and rapid. You know, something like 15 minute games is probably a better choice for you. Um, I think that maybe around the middle club level, uh, Blitz becomes a more reasonable um, method of practice. I don't know where exactly, maybe somewhere around 1600, 1800, something like that. Um, there are a lot of decisions that you can, you know, reasonable decisions that you can make automatically compared to uh, when you're a beginner. You, you can't necessarily do that. And it becomes more useful. One thing I've also noticed as well um, is that um, higher blitz ratings seem to have some correlation with people who uh, started playing chess uh, when they were young. I noticed that a lot of um, players, uh, even players with like good, um, like, you know, club, club, club level ratings who started playing chess when they were adults tend to have relatively lower uh, blitz ratings. Maybe they're not as comfortable with the automatic uh, decisions. So that's something to keep in mind as well. But I think that somewhere around like the middle club level, like Blitz becomes uh, a, a very reasonable and useful form of practice. 
Okay, good advice. Yeah, and that's about, I think I said 1,500 in my book. Don't quote me on it. It was between yeah. 1,400 and 1,600. Something like so, that, yeah. So we're, we're roughly on the same page there. Um, and Todd, so you play the King's uh, Indian. I know at times you played the King's Gambit. Are you still yes. keeping it real with the King's Gambit these days? Yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely still playing the King's Gambit. Uh, I think the King's Gambit is an underrated uh, underrated opening. I learned the King's Gambit from John Shaw's uh, uh, wonderful book, uh on it and i've been playing it for years and um it's one of those openings where um it has high practical value um the player playing black you know they usually face the king's gambit in a small minority of their game so that's like always a nice uh you know thing to be playing on your home turf and uh have your opponents uh be uncomfortable and uh even when people prepare against me like they can maybe get some good uh position out of the opening uh, memorizing some theory, but then they have to play a messy King's Gambit position against me still. And so I've had a couple of games um, against uh, strong players where they got good um, positions by preparing out of the opening, but then I was able to uh, trick them later. So I think that at least at my level, the King's Gambit is still very uh, practical, um, but it is one of those areas where I am a little exposed uh, with a narrow opening. Uh, so I have been, um, working on some secret alternative, uh, weapons against E-45 more recently also. Okay. So anyone listening, hold off on the, the extreme <laughs> prep for time, <laughs> but, but that's interesting. And I think that there's also broader conclusions there because of course, like on like chicken chess club, you'll hear them debating, like, you know, is white losing after the two F4 on the King's <laughs> Gambit or is white just worse, you know? So obviously we're not talking about like from an engine perspective, a good opening, yes. but if a player as strong as you like can, can make it work and feel, and obviously there's thought behind it. You're not, you know, you're not just you're not you're not spending thousands of dollars and devoting all these hours and away from your family like you know for um you know giggles um so if someone like you can feel like it's viable that has broad implications for like many other openings yeah i think that it's playable for a while there is one uh extreme example uh that i've been playing for a long time and recently I uh, have had to move away for where there was uh, an opening that I played a main line in the dragon that I played as black. Uh, and this is nine Bishop D seven after nine castles in the main uh, line of the dragon. Queen side, and this right? is probably an opening that is just outright losing for black. Like I tried recently uh, to uh, work on it with the computer and like find some way to hold it, even with computer defense. And I couldn't like stockfish was just beating itself no matter uh, what I tried. However, this is an opening that I've scored like really well with in Blitz. And even over the board, um, I have a great score um, in it just because I know the theory really well. There's a lot of tricks and traps, and I know like the uh, opposite ca side castling uh, plans well. However, I did recently get my number pulled in uh, that opening at the World Open by Ryo Chen, uh, who is a very young uh, super talent. Uh, he's like a 13-year-old international master. And uh, he prepared against me uh, in that line. And then he also put me away with a flawless technique. So that was the first time in many years of playing this opening that uh, somebody like played the theoretical reputation against me and like also didn't make a mistake, uh, make a mistake later. So now I've been forced to um, to revisit that choice. But if I can play a line that is like theoretically losing, uh, probably with uh, good success. I think that there's a lot of latitude in terms of what is possible, like even up to like the 2200 level in your opening choices. That's interesting. And we talked about uh, in our um, trip report, like often with these world open type tournaments, the pairings won't go up that far in advance. So while you might worry in theory about being a stationary target in practice, it might not be that true. Um, in this yeah. game against Ryo Chen, how much time did he have before the, the round? Uh, he probably only had, yeah, just the normal like 15 minutes, wow. something like that. So, yeah, but somebody like him who's out. who's a little kid and it's going to be like fast and like sharp with like, uh, you know, leechessandchess.com, like he's almost guaranteed to uh, to prepare against me. Um, so uh, that's like, you know, uh, a case where you're really exposed. If you play like, you know, a different player, maybe they won't be able to prepare against you so quickly, but like the super talented little kids, I think they're like always preparing before the rounds. Yeah. And also it might be something where like, obviously a player like him is extremely active, pretty booked up to begin with. So yes. it might be something where 
he says, oh, Bishop D7, and he already knows why it's bad, you know, whereas someone yeah. else might might be like sort of starting from scratch, you know? Yeah, no, he really crushed me with his preparation in that game. It was funny because he prepared against, I was unable to uh, find like an account for him, so I couldn't really prepare um, for him. And he obviously found my account and prepared, and he found like a move order that I don't normally face, but I had played in a few games. And in the blitz games, I always chose the same bad move. And in the game that we played, I didn't remember those blitz games that I played the same bad move over the board. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just funny that he knew that I always played this, you know, bad move, giving up a second pawn for kind of no good reason. And after the game, he was, you know, like, why are you doing this? You're giving up a second pawn. Like you've done this three times in blitz. I was like, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah. Highly relatable, Todd. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you're doing that uh, to make me feel better, but, <laughs> but yeah, these kids are, these kids are tough. Um, Todd, well, we've got a couple questions from uh, Patreon supporters of the pod. Uh, so let's jump into one from Jason Murray. So Jason asks, and Jason, thank you for supporting Perpetual Chess. He says, hey, Todd, I often struggle with implementing a good thought process in games. Sometimes I think things through very logically and really look at tactical vulnerabilities like undefended pieces, uh, pieces vulnerable to pins, etc. And this works well. At other times, I just look at whatever jumps out at me, mostly by pattern recognition and miss things. I know I shouldn't do the latter, but sometimes it still happens. How can I apply a good thought process regularly? Thanks. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, so there's kind of a distinction in this question between like the algorithm uh, side of thinking about chess and the intuitive side of thinking about chess. So the algorithm side is like looking around the whole board and calculating every like check and capture, or it's doing um, something uh, Jeremy Stillman asks where you're thinking about like all of the different imbalances, the imbalances one yes. by one, and then forming um, a conclusion. And then there's the other side, which is what strong players are generally doing when they're thinking about chess, which is just intuitively noticing things like intuitively noticing that there's, you know, some discovered attack along this line or that some pawn or square is weak and you want to go after it just because like it feels uh, right. So I think that both of these things are necessary. I think that the former, the algorithm side is a good thing to do in practice and a good thing to do when you're studying to like really slowly and methodically like look through everything. But it's often something that is not practical to do in a game. And in a game, you have to trust your intuition, I think, you know, whatever level it's at, um, and save your like slower logical thinking for a couple of key moments. Otherwise, you're going to get uh, overwhelmed. Um, but I am uh, a fan of this like slower methodical uh, side when um, like studying and learning. And I, I, I was a particularly big Jeremy Silman um, enthusiast. I, I, I really loved his books and used his method like while studying chess when I was around the like 1400, 1600, 1800 level. Okay. And was this mostly reassess your chess or amateur's minds? No, it was mind? the amateur's minds. Okay. So the amateur's minds. Oh God, I love that book. Um, I know it's controversial, not, you know, some, some people really love it. Uh, uh, not everybody does, but I absolutely loved it. I think that book was involved in a huge rating jump from around like 1400 level to 1800 uh, for me, because it just opened my eyes to, um, you know, all of these common, like bad patterns that I was doing in like all of my games, like, you know, like I, I just like look at a position and I like decide that I'm going to attack their king because that's what I want to do instead of like, you know, the position actually calling for it. Um, it was a really eye opening book uh, for me. And I found all these examples, um, just 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 the, the pattern of exposing and then picking apart the uh, faulty thought processes of weaker players to be totally brilliant. Nice. And so were you because uh, i know i've pieced together a bit of your background just from us being friendly online for years and didn't even know you were from maryland until you mentioned um in this interview so that 1400 to 1800 jump was that like in your high school years or when when was that yeah so um i started playing chess when i was uh, 13 so my first tournament was in uh, 2000 when i was in uh, the eighth grade and then i jumped into um uh, right around 1800, I believe the summer after high school. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was rising through the, uh, the club ratings quickly. I lived kind of like, um, uh, a little bit, uh, far away from like main tournaments. So I wasn't like playing over the board tournaments 
uh, that often back then. So I was making kind of big jumps because I was playing online just constantly. Uh, and this was back uh, uh, when I was playing on a uh, fix and us chess live and those, uh, those older, uh, older servers. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah. And one more thing on the thinking processes. I also have a chapter about that called chess checklists and said, uh, again, I'm glad to hear Todd sort of similar conclusions. Basically I'm a strong advocate of, working consciously on your thought process when you're playing for fun on your computer. And even like if if you feel like it's a weakness, actually using a physical checklist um, with questions of your cultivating. I do enjoy Jeremy Selman's books, but uh, something like Reassess Your Chess, um, there's so many imbalances. It's too many, you know, yeah. like like Agard's three questions. Uh, what are the weaknesses? What is my worst place piece? What is my opponent intending? Like, I like it because it's you can you can remember it like and you can actually when you don't know what to do in a quiet position in a game, you can actually think of it. And obviously checks captures threats in terms of tactics, as Jason alluded to in his question. Same thing. But some of the other ones, it's like there's so much to think about. And yes, you would like to automate it all. But you kind of have to make some hard decisions about which questions to ask yourself. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, Todd, we got one more Patreon question. That was a very insightful answer. So let's uh, press our luck here. So this one is from Noah Zucker. Shout out to Noah. Um, and he recently wrote a blog post. I know he feels that, um, I think he might actually say this in this question, but he um, feels that He's as like a developing amateur player. I think he's rated maybe 1500. Apologies if I'm wrong, Noah, but um, he's tired of people telling him not to study openings. He feels like they are important at his level. Um, but anyway, Noah mentions, he says, regarding unsound openings, which in the age of TikTok chess are more common than ever, do we need to just buckle down and memorize the refutations of the Stafford, Halloween, whatever gambit? Most of us serious adult improvers would rather be studying solid chess, not rote memorization of useless sidelines. Do you find that you still must, sorry, do you find that you still must make time for memorizing refutations of the latest gimmicks or have you developed a mindset or strategy for handling unfamiliar trappy opening moves? Yeah, so I definitely, I, there's, I mean, different schools of thought on this. I definitely fall more on the side of like, you need to know and like uh, learn it. So yeah, like all of these crazy mad gambits, like I think it is important uh, to, um, to learn something against them. Uh, but that's also, uh, you know, that's something that I like to do. Like, I'm going to do that anyway, because I enjoy like learning opening sense, like memorizing theory and, you know, getting to play it in my games. So when I face one of these gambits and I'm able to like bash out, uh, a lot of theory and refute it, that's like immensely satisfying to me. So, um, that's something that I think is, is good for your results. Um, and that I would do anyway. Um, but, yeah, I think that it's important to at least like rel relative to your level, uh, know something against these tricky openings, because otherwise you're handing your opponent a large practical advantage of having an opening that they know well and that you don't. And in the case of like Stafford, especially some of these really, really tricky, trappy ones, um, you know, you're also having to walk a tightrope and uh, dodge like a lot of like common practical pitfalls. So I think that's a practical advantage you don't want to hand your opponent. You don't necessarily have to go crazy, like uh, memorizing tons of theory. You know, you can put in an amount of work that's, um, you know, uh, relative to your level and how often you face these things, but it really helps to know a little bit against these crazy gambits. Yeah, well said. And I think the Stafford in particular, shout out to Eric Rosen, like, you know, yeah. you, you just you just got to do the work and learn it, but it's not good. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, so there's a big reward if you if you do that. I actually don't even know what the Halloween Gambit is, though. So there I might show how but the Halloween Gambit is this crazy knight takes e5 sack. You you, 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 you sack a whole piece and like the four knights or whatever. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's unsound, but you get this crazy like your pawns all start rolling in the center and, uh, you know, uh, you can trick them if they don't know what they're doing. Okay. Yeah. And to Noah's question, that sort of shows what it circles back to what we were talking about, the importance of playing online, because it's really hard to know everything. But yeah. if you are playing regularly online, like certainly once you see an opening twice, if it's a dodgy gambit, like yeah, probably someone made a video about it or it's on one of the chess training sites, whatever the origination of it is. The point is, like, it's out there. Um, yeah, you, you should you should uh, 
take the time and learn it. But yeah, and the Halloween is a good example because the Halloween gambit, like you really only have to learn a few moves to get a good safe position as black. So you should invest the time, you know, just to learn like the few moves of the basic refutation. Uh, that's much better than knowing nothing against the Halloween gambit. It's important to put in like a little bit of effort there. Okay. Um, so it sounds like you're doing most of your learning digitally, Todd. You did shout out the Stoneman books. Um, are there any other books that were particularly formative for you? Yeah. So I'm going to mention a book that possibly has never been mentioned on your podcast. I'm wow. not sure. Uh, I could be wrong, but it was the first uh, book that I ever, um, the first chess book that I ever got. Uh, I, I, I just walked into like a Borders bookstore one day. I wanted to buy a chess book and that was what they had on the shelf. And it was a book called Attacking Chess by Josh Waitskin. Um, so this is a book that Waitskin wrote when he was 19, and it was basically an introduction to like tactical themes uh, in chess. So he has chapters on pin and fork and decoy, and then he has some like more complicated chapters. Like he has a chapter called Courage, which is about uh, you know uh, trusting your calculation and com complicated lines where you can't be sure of everything. But uh, the book was, in addition to the instruction, like he like weaved in all of these wonderful little stories. Uh, like every chapter had like a little preamble with a different story about his like scholastic career. So like, you know, traveling with his dad and going and playing in some, you know, like smoky church basement somewhere, or, you know, having some high stakes game in a scholastic tournament or what happened after some crushing loss. And the stories were just so wonderful. Um, and the instruction was so good. Uh, I read that book over and over again when I was like a total beginner. And I think it in inspired me a lot uh, because, you know, I liked the stories and uh, um, I learned all these tactical themes, um, you know, uh, and then later uh, I was a big fan of Waitskin's uh, Chess Master uh, videos as well, which really had the same thing. Like he was a very good storyteller in addition to um, uh in addition to having interesting games and chess content. So it, it was like really motivating for me to follow his stuff. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's never been recommended. Obviously, the, the art of learning has come up uh, periodically. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah no, Attacking Chess is really a diamond in the rough. I really uh, loved that book. I, I read it like a million times while listening to like Good Charlotte on my uh, on my disc <laughs> in like, you know, 1999, 2000. Have you revisited it at all in like the past five years? Like, Yeah, I open it up occasionally. And it's one of those things where because I read that book so early, another one that I read early and remember vividly was Best Lessons of a Chess Coach by Weira Mantry. Right. But like when I look at the examples in his book, like I immediately remember like the stories and the positions. I remember most of the solutions um, to uh, to the puzzles. It's yeah, it's it's very nice to go through it occasionally. I looked at it a little bit with uh, with my son when he was rising up the uh, the triple digits as well. Is and is your son still playing? Yeah, yeah, he still plays uh, chess. Uh, his uh, his interest in scholastic chess. So he started playing like when he was like five and a half, he played his first tournament. And at some point his interest dipped, but now it's like back up again. And because he's like a little older um, and, you know, just more mature and like developing cognitively, I think like he's been having some nice results. He recently crossed uh, the 1000 mark. His rating is around uh, 1050 now. So he was like uh, really excited about that. And uh, uh, yeah, he is, you know, like having fun and excited about going to uh, scholastic tournaments Um and, uh, you know, he likes to, uh, you know, look at his games a little bit with me after the tournament. So like, it's been, it's been a fun time with him and his chats recently. Awesome. Yeah. My son's still not interested in playing, but as we record this on August 24th, the, the tiebreak finale of the world cup was, uh, this morning. Um, and, uh, and my, my son finally on the last day was trained that when I came downstairs, he'd turn, I, I watch especially for a tournament of this magnitude, I put it on on YouTube on my TV. So he yeah. had the finale on when I came down at 7.30 in the morning. So nice. uh, so, so he's well-trained as well. And let me ask you, Todd, so how, like, all these conclusions you've drawn about your own chess improvement, obviously watching your son uh, come from a beginner, it's sort of a different perspective, but what sort of guidance did you try to give him? Yeah, um, I think I tried different things, um, and some of them worked well, and some of them uh, didn't. Um, I think that he was an interesting case because he started playing chess at like a very young age. Um, so he was at an age where like a hundred percent of how he learns um, chess was pattern recognition, um, compared to you know I've uh, worked with uh, some people who are starting chess maybe like um 
in uh, adulthood or in middle age. And they're like the opposite. They, they're kind of like interface to learning chassis, like all logic and the pattern recognition develops more gradually. Um, so one of the first things that we did was we went through uh, the Bobby Fisher teaches chess book, which is another, um, uh, well, I mean, that, that, that book's very popular, but it's just like a, a, a nice book that goes through like a lot of examples of like getting out of check and like what is checkmate and what isn't and some basic tactical things like back rank checkmates. Um, and so that was something that he absorbed uh, very quickly. Um, whereas other things that were more logical, um, I kind of had to wait for him to uh, to get older to understand them. Um, like it, it's, it's, it's interesting at, at his young age, he would like absorb these tactical patterns very quickly. But if you told him something more abstract, like, you know, don't move the same piece twice in the opening, develop all of your pieces one by one, uh, that wasn't, you know, reaching for that general principle and then like applying it logically wasn't on his mind, um, at that like very young, uh, very young age. So I think that the main way that he's learned and uh, gotten better at chess uh, is similar to uh, lots of people is just by playing um, a lot and regularly over the years. Like he's always been active on chess.com and Lee chess, and he plays a lot of scholastic tournaments and he's uh, gradually just gotten better and learned things. I think primarily by doing that. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. That's um, especially at that age, it's uh, it can, it can be relatively effortless if you're just engaged in it. Uh, yeah. Every day. Um, cool. Well, Todd, this has been great as expected. So obviously you've got a, a wide experience as a chess dad, chess data gatherer, chess player. So if you were to try to synthesize like sort of your own approach to, to chess at this stage of your life, uh, what would you say? Yeah, I think the main thing, so Ben Feingold has said a similar thing, uh, uh, to this, I think on your podcast or maybe on his, his YouTube channel, which is that, um, this is maybe an ironic thing to say after, you know, I spent days like, uh, compiling this giant spreadsheet of numbers, uh, and like reading improvements, but your attitude towards chess, I think it's very important that you are not fixated on rating. And instead you have to find something that you enjoy doing and motivates you. And you have to like love and enjoy and be curious about the game. Um, and I think that instead of worrying about like what your rating should be or what kind of rating improvement is possible, or if your rating is going up fast enough, you need to uh, find something that you really like to do. For me, that is currently playing lots of blitz, learning about openings and uh, learning new openings and memorizing theory. It's just very motivating. And that's what I like to do. Um, it's the same thing when, you know, uh, uh, your training strength, instead of worrying about like, what should my bench press be? Or like, you know, you know, I want a 300 pound bench press, but it's only 135 right now. Instead of thinking about these things, you go into the gym, you focus on specifically what you're doing that day and executing your lifts well. And then when you lift two more pounds than you did the previous session, you like, you know, uh, enjoy and appreciate that. So I think that for me, I'm going to try uh, to continue playing as much as possible. Uh, I'm going to stay focused, I think, on playing a lot of Blitz and developing experience that way and learning openings for the foreseeable future. And uh, hopefully um, I can have some good results and play some good games. If I achieve any kind of like rating improvements, uh, that would be great. And when that happens, like I'll try to make sure to celebrate and enjoy that. Uh, but the main thing for me is just focusing on, uh, playing a lot and, uh, you know, enjoying chess and being curious and trying to learn. Um, the other thing that I think is important and a little overlooked in the chess world is the physical health side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, I tweeted recently that, um, one common thread that I see among players who have impressive rating uh, increases, uh, like after the age of 50, for example, is that they all seem to be in like reasonable, uh, physical health. Um, you know, I, I, I think that a lot of these people are not necessarily fitness freaks, but an example that comes to mind is Larry Kaufman when he was, um, achieving the, uh, the GM title in the world senior, he wrote about how like he booked a special hotel so that he could swim every day and get a little bit of physical activity, um, so, you know, just like, you know, maintaining his health generally and engaging in regular physical activity was something that was on his mind. And I think that the older you get, the more important this is 
uh, for your performance. Um, you don't necessarily have to be, you know, like a freak about lifting weights, although the few players that I know who are freaks about lifting weights in the chess world. So, uh, myself, James Canty, Dean Ippolito and Greg Shahadi are all people I notice who seem to be having like pretty good, consistent results. So it might help. Philemon Thomas too. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's interesting. Um, yeah, great insights. And, and, and if you're wrong, at least you're fit, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the, uh, that's the main reason to, uh, to do this stuff. It's not necessarily because it's going to improve your chest, but it will, uh, improve your life and, you know, put you in a cool upgraded body that can do more stuff. And that's like really nice. Excellent. All right. Well, Todd, this has been extremely insightful, much appreciated. Um, so if anyone wants to like, say, help you with the data project, as I mentioned earlier, or reach you in any other way, what are the best ways? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. I am at the strong chess on Twitter. Uh, you can also find me on chess.com, uh, where I am just my name, Todd Bryant on chess.com. Excellent. Well, Todd, uh, very inspiring and lots of wisdom. So um, thanks for, again, thanks for doing the research and for sharing your insights. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me.